Welcome to She Invests. Join us every week for conversations focused on the growing number of female angel investors, the real unicorns. You'll hear from existing female angel investors, VCs, and fund managers on their investment thesis. From deal flow to exits, they will share the best practices that contribute to their success. Female angel investors will be equipped with the tools and resources to confidently activate their capital in order to make an impact in their community and the global economy. With your host, active angel investor and founder of Para Angels, Dr. Sylvia Ma. Today we have a stellar guest on the podcast, Trish Costello, a Silicon Valley-based entrepreneur and investor. She has been a personal mentor to me as a significant contributor to the angel investing ecosystem and a rock star venture capitalist. Trish is the founder and CEO of Portfolio, a collaborative entrepreneurial equity investing platform and family of venture funds. She was named as one of the 100 most intriguing entrepreneurs of 2014 by Goldman Sachs and top 10 women to watch in tech in 2015 by Inc. Magazine. She is recognized internationally uh, for her pioneering work in educating and preparing venture capital investment partners through the prestigious Kaufman Fellows Program, a global educational institute preparing the leadership of the venture capital industry located in Palo Alto, California. She has undoubtedly played a leading role nationally in obtaining greater financial equity investments in women's businesses and in funding initiatives supporting high growth women entrepreneurs. So with all of that, Trish, welcome to the show. Oh, my pleasure to be here, Sylvia. I would love to know how you got involved in uh, being an angel investor. I love your your history in the Kaufman Fellow Programs, even founding that. Just amazing years of your life. Would love to just kind of go back in time and see what what that was, um, what was that impetus? Yes. Oh, well, gosh, that would be going way back <laughs> because uh, probably 40 uh, at least 35 years ago, um, I, I actually funded my sister's daycare. It's been a lifelong uh, passion of mine to see uh, new entrepreneurial companies form and to realize that you both have the energy and effort that has to go into it, but somebody also has to write checks. And, um, you know, I even look back then, those were some of the early days of daycares. Um, you know, when women were really starting to move into the workforce and, um, and most of, you know, many of those initial daycare centers were funded by women, you know, collectively. And, and here we are now many years later and we see, um, that, you know, we're still doing that We're you know, many of us are still writing out those checks. So it was, it was early and that passion, I think, and focus has uh, remained the same. I appreciate that question. I haven't thought of that for a long time. That is really great connection between what you're doing now and just where you started from. And um, of course, I've write it, wrote in checks to to colleagues as well to start gyms or help them out or something like that. So great, great story. What was your first investment? Like, how was it? Um, did you have a mentor? Did you have to do it alone? How was that? You know, I think over the years, um, you know, I started small, making small investments with people I knew well in areas that I knew well and put a lot of time and energy uh, behind those companies. So, you know, fairly, fairly conservative, you know, the, the, the things, you know, I mean, a, a fairly consistent kind of traditional way of investing. What I didn't know early on, and I did need to get mentoring for along the way, was, um, you know, the legal pieces. Um, you know, it's easy enough, um, you know, I think if you have a creative spirit, to you know, realize we need resources and to pool money, but as you, um, as I matured in it, I realized that I needed to be protected, or needed to have the communication between us, um, you know, more clearly defined. And that's what you know, and a really important part of the investing process. I uh, learned that later, and um, and that was from being around other investors, uh, seeing how they documented things. Uh, being able to determine terms uh, and boards, seats, and those types of things. It's kind of an apprentice, uh, an apprenticeship type of work, you know. Early on, there were not classes. In fact, at my Kaufman Foundation days, we created mm -hmm. the first mm -hmm. angel investing courses. And um, they didn't really exist much before the mid-90s. And I had started quite a bit earlier. Well, in fact, 
you know, I had a venture, a company was venture backed in the 80s. That knowledge and, and experience of actually acquiring venture money and moving from an angel myself to getting angel investing uh, to venture money, and then later going to the Kauffman Foundation and being able to create best practice around that, training around that, and a scale it around the country and around the world is kind of, I guess, if you, that's the whole arc, you know, if we're kind of looking at that whole, you know, direction. And do you think that's really, uh, I know that it's beneficial to go from the entrepreneur to the angel investor to the VC and then being that academic um, and really building those best practices for uh, the next generation or the next um, angel investor that's coming through. How really is important, uh, how important is that? And what did you learn along the way? I mean, I know there's like a thousand things that you learned, but um, the thing, you know, let's say the, the top ones that you learned in that pathway. Yeah, well, you know what I'd even say almost as a prelude to that is I I honestly, I mean, the first the first check I wrote was when I was 22 years old and my sister wanted to start a daycare. And um, that was and I was working at AT&T and I, you know, had, thought I had a lot of money because I had no, you know, responsibilities or encumbrances. Uh, and I honestly believe today that the most important thing that I've ever done is write that first check. Because there's there's often a fear to it, and so what I what I say to people is write that first small check to someone you know back in a company that you believe in, um, you know make it small enough that you're not you know it's you're not fearful about it you're not waking up in the middle of the night going oh my god am I going to lose this money, but writing that first check is important, and all of us that uh, have a little bit of extra money. Um, and have some expertise and some experience, we know enough to write out that first small check. Now, over the course of time, you're going to learn a lot. And you're going to, if you want to get into this more, you're going to group with others. And you're going to do bigger investments and deals. And you're going to, you know, develop a thesis. Um, But the biggest, truly, the biggest problem I see today, even Sylvia, I know a lot of people, a lot of women with a lot of money. Uh, women that will write out a million dollar check to philanthropy, but are afraid to write out a ten thousand dollar check to enable a company to be formed or to grow that they would really like to have in the market. And I actually think that a lot of that is it's it's a fear of making a mistake. We are so afraid to be embarrassed or ashamed. Um, we've often been encouraged not to mess with our money. Someone else is going to take care of it for us. I uh, and so. You know, that million dollar philanthropy check, you're not going to be embarrassed about that. Um, and so, you know, we, 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 we let fear keep us from doing some of the things that could be most impactful and actually even most enjoyable and that we could be most proud of. I love that. Yeah. Um, you know, the philanthropy aspect of it versus investing in a startup. Um, love that that whole discussion. Uh, because a lot of women do give so much money into the philanthropy. What about investing in another woman who's starting off her business? And that's what you guys do at Portfolio. Yes, yes. That's exactly what we do at Portfolio. The interesting thing with Portfolio, I think is that Rather than, you know, I have a lot of experience in the in the venture uh, industry, the traditional venture industry. And what I didn't want to do with Portfolio, uh, I have a lot of experience in the angel uh, space as well, is I didn't want to just create something with a nice name that has a, a, a female, you know, uh, connection to it uh, and just put women into something that's been done in the same way. Uh, that was built for men, but just bringing women together. I wanted to really, what we did is really take a step back and say, if we were doing this greenfield, which we were, what would we build precisely and specifically? What would we design with women in mind? How do we like to organize? How do we like to think about things, mull over decisions, analyze? How do we make decisions together? How do we add value? What would we specifically do based on how we operate and how we organize ourselves in other areas of our lives. You know, I think too many times we look at financing systems and markets and we almost think that there's some kind of organic, you know, they're like a plant, you know, it's just, this is, you know, how nature works. These are systems that were built 
by men in the 1940s and 50s in the venture world and angel investing in environments where there were only men. We were not in business schools. We were not allowed to get loans. We weren't allowed to create companies in a lot of states. And and nothing bad about men. There were only men doing this, and they built systems that worked specifically for how they like to operate in the 1940s and 50s. And so all along now, and, and even a big mistake I made in the early days when I was training VCs and creating angel training was that my goal was to get a woman into a venture fund. And what I didn't realize at the time was I was taking that one woman and forcing her into an environment that was set that was not going to change. Any changing that was going to be done, any, you know, what uh, was going to be done by that woman addressing that system. You know, how, how, what, what, what changes was she going to make so that they liked her style? so that she could invest like they did, so that she could think like they did, so she could give feedback like they did. And um, I put a lot of brilliant women into the venture industry and uh, later realized that, you know, it was probably the only option we had at the time, but it really is not the best option. You know, we, we today we talk a lot about being authentic. And uh, this was 22, 23, 24 years ago we started this. You know, it's very hard to be authentic when you're constantly having to mold yourself into a system that was not built with you in mind. That's a long winded answer. No, I love that. (laughs) I love that. You know, I think that that's what portfolio does so well. It's collaborative um, and also disruptive in the in the whole world of VCs and how to do it. So that's brilliance, I think, um, is a disruptive um, uh, platform so that more women can thrive and be successful as angels. So what's kind of that equation? If you were going to say, what's that, that, what's that ideal equation for portfolio so that women can get more activated? I think, first of all, it needs to work in our lives. Um, and so specifically what portfolio does is we enable women to put a, a relatively small amount of money into a venture fund or funds of their choosing on an annual basis And uh, that money is invested in six to 10 entrepreneurial companies um, in a specific vertical uh, each year. So we have an active aging fund. We have the rising tide fund. We have a consumer fund. We have an enterprise fund. We're getting ready to launch a women's health or what we may call a femtech fund. And so you're able to put uh, $10,000 into that fund with 98 other women. Uh, It's run by a group of five to seven women, uh, each of these funds. Um, We are, uh, we have a national footprint and we'll invest in, uh, in those companies in six to 10 companies in a year. So, uh, and you can be as involved as you'd like, or you can be as passive as you like. So it works in your life. If you're, you know, dealing with graduation right now and you don't have time to come on for a month or two, that's absolutely all right. You know, there's no, this is a guilt-free zone. Um, if we're looking at companies in a specific, you know, vertical or space and you have a passion for that, expertise for that, you can be, jump in and source those companies, uh, send us companies. You can, uh, you know, help us research those companies, what we call diligence. You can help grow those companies. If we make an investment, you can review everything. You can train to be, you know, a leader of one of these funds. So it, it, you can make it, you can, you can adjust it to your life. But the important thing is that you're stepping in and you're backing the companies that you, you want to be a part of an industry you're interested in and you get instant diversification. So within that year, Um, some of the most recent data coming out of the Kauffman Foundation says that you need to do 30 investments in five years to be successful. It's really hard. You know, I was an active angel investor. I didn't consistently do six six investments every year. You need to see you're probably going to look at 30 or 40 or more uh, options before you make a decision. If you're being, you know, selective about it, you know, it's almost it's a full time job. If you're going to do, you know, if you're going to do well, seven investments, five to seven investments a year. And so that's what I like about what we created with Portfolio. We're basically combining our efforts combining our networks and our resources. And we're doing that work together. 
And then together we're making markets. So it's like it's making the best use of what we bring to the table, but um, enables us to step in and step out based on what's happening in the rest of our lives. And I like the other disruptive aspect of that is that um, you're creating new markets. So you're creating um, the femtech market, um, or you're creating new things that really make a difference to that woman who's investing. That's exactly right. And Sylvia, you may have heard me talk about this before, um, because I often, often will about femtech is such a great example. Because, you know, I early on, uh, a couple of years ago, when I was starting Portfolio, I was seeing these really great companies come through, run by women, focused by women, and in areas where I thought, oh, my gosh, that's a gigantic market. Uh, And I would see people, I would see venture capitalists pass on them. And so, one, I'll even give you a quick example, was a breast pump. And I thought it was the way they had designed the new product and the app that went along with it, I thought, that is inspired. For someone who had twins that I breastfed, Um, until they were almost a year old, I thought, wow, I would have loved to have had this app that has the productivity, you know, one side of it was just amazing. And I saw it being passed on and I thought the team was amazing. And so I I called a venture capitalist who had passed on the deal. And I said, what am I missing? You know, huge market, great team, product quite unique. And he said, it's the ick factor, I-C-K, the ick factor. He said, it's just, I don't want to talk about this every Monday morning with my partners. It's just icky. And what I realized at that very moment, the light bulb went off and I thought, we are going to make a lot of money with the ick factor because there's so many different areas. Childbirth, that's icky. You know, menopause, fashion for the plus size woman. I can go on, anything to do with women's health. You know, I could go on and on and on. There's so many products and services that are so necessary, even aging. Um, One of our areas that we're doing very well in, we understand that market. We need the products and services. We know where the gaps are. We know what we'd pay for them. We're starting most of those companies. And if it were not for women, most of those companies would not be funded. So it's just critically important and critically exciting. And we're going to make a lot of money doing it together. I love that. Definitely, you have talked about the ick factor. And I always love that. uh, (laughs) Because we need more products that that are more diverse. Uh, We we that not not just women, but more diverse products um, for the right reasons and for the right impact into families and communities. So that's that's amazing. And then the other thing that I wanted to talk about, too, is we've talked about this as well, the two of us is that um, when you create a portfolio, you realize that when a woman wants to write a check, or she's thinking about angel investing, it's very hard to do it by yourself. But when you have a collaborative, and we've talked a lot about this is like, okay, we're going to put a collaborative in, but it's a fund. And I have some mentors, and I have all these things, that psyche, you you want a little bit into like, what are the details of what the portfolio does, but that psyche of that woman in writing that first check. Yeah, that first check can be it can be difficult. And one of the things we do is all of our funds, are, uh, we call learn by investing funds. So not only are you, uh, especially when you're coming in for the first time, not only are you running out that first check and you're part of a collaborative, but it's designed so that you can feel completely comfortable um, asking questions, uh, being a part of uh, the learning of this, uh, calibrating um, your views of a company versus, you know, how the more experienced investors see it. And those lead investors Um, Their job is both to source companies from around the country, the very best companies they can find in those verticals, but they also agree that they're wanting to bring along women, um, the women in our groups, to bring them along as investors as well. And no matter where you start, we do Ask Me Anything sessions um, where you can talk about anything. You know, when we hear companies pitch, um, after those pitches are done, the entrepreneurs go off and you do a poll and you vote for the companies and then you hear, and that's all private. So you don't have to be embarrassed about it. And then you hear the lead investors evaluate and analyze those companies and they often have different views of it. So you're able to see how, you know, someone who's highly technology based sees the company versus someone who's all about the team and how they evaluate the company. And, and you can, you really start to develop your kind of hone your whole evaluation skills too. And you do it 
in this way, um, you know, over time. Um, and you can get more and you can go up higher and higher as far as the skill level. Um, we also are connected to the Angel Capital Association. So we tap into another 10,000, you know, angels to do this. But it's just very important to us that you're able to plug in at that level where you can learn and it's not just completely passive. We all are looking to be able to have an impact on our world. And a lot of power comes through our money. But it's only power. There's only power in our money if we use it. And we want you to be confident, not just of the money you're putting in portfolio or um, Next Wave or any of the other funds, Chloe Capital, Hera Funds. Um, we, we want you to be able to, to feel comfortable, you know, doing individual deals uh, or just understanding how to add value to companies. And, and so we want to make sure that anytime you're connected with us in an event, in a fund, that you're having your needs met to feel more comfortable with how to use your money and your power. I love that. And that goes towards that investment thesis. You mentioned that at the beginning, and this kind of um, leads into that. How does somebody create an investment thesis? How do you get there? I know Kaufman d- does great education. Portfolio does great education. Um, how how does somebody, if you're just a single angel investor, say, this is my investment thesis? I think that's one of the most important things that you can do uh, because it provides a focus and provides kind of a, you know, a little roadmap around your investing. And I think oftentimes when you first start, it's kind of rudimentary and it becomes more sophisticated as you go. Um, we usually look at three areas. We look at where, what is my, so we look at what your, what your profession is. So what, what's your expertise? And your expertise can be both your profession um, as well as your passion. So I'm a pediatrician. I do want to, you know, work in uh, children's health because I have such knowledge and expertise in that area, for example. Um, but I also, uh, I'm really into the environment and to green products. So, so my two areas in which I'm going to focus when I start are those areas where I have knowledge and expertise. And it's going to be children's health and it's going to be, you know, green. So that number one is very important. You would be surprised how often people don't do that. They think, well, I'm going to start off, I'm going to do something I have no knowledge about at all. And, and that's often a mistake because you can't really evaluate or you're spending so much time just getting yourself, you know, uh, acclimated to a new area that it ends up being a drag, you know, in your life. So I say, first of all, start where you have interest, knowledge, expertise, or a passion. Look at your environment then and figure out what's going to be the best mix, uh, the best match with that. So um, most angels, when they start, are going to invest within, you know, within a geography or an area, or you can select a fund. And so what's going to be the best match for that? Um, You know, is there a health fund? that is in San Diego that's going to be able to um, provide uh, companies and other experts in the health space that will be good for me and be a good starting opportunity. So, you know, what's my specialty space? Where can I source those deals or have that community? Um, what and then, and then you get into the money piece. How much money am I going to put aside for this? You do want to diversify, so I'm going to put aside $100,000 or let's go smaller. I'm going to put across, I'm going to put aside $25,000 and over the next three or four years, I'm going to do $5,000 to $10,000, you know, a year investing in those companies in that space. Um, and I want to do early stage. So you can lay, you lay it out in that way and you come back to that. You let that be your roadmap. You know, you can occasionally go off, but what you're going to see when you first get started is all kinds of, you know, shiny objects, as we say. So someone comes to you, don't they? This this happens, right, Sylvia? Oh, my God, this is the best deal I've ever seen. You know, you're going to make so much money. It's guaranteed. And it's in um, AI. And you think, oh, my God, all these people tell me AI, this is it. But you have no basis of knowledge or expertise. If you were going to become an expert in AI, you would need to read you know, for, you would need to come on a course of study for three months. And so stay away from the shiny objects at the beginning. See a lot of deals, you know, write out that first check, make sure that first check is small because like pancakes, often that one's the one that's going to be thrown away. 
Uh, but keep going back to your thesis. Okay, was that what I would wanted to do? Is this in pediatric? Is this in children's health there? Green. Is it within the dollar amount I was talking about? Is it within that stage? Can I call upon these people around me to help me make that decision? I love all of that. And what is your investment thesis? Well, my investment thesis has has shifted with portfolio. My investment thesis I'm going that I'll relate to you is really the portfolio investment thesis. We believe in investing in companies where women make markets. So we want to add value. Just like I talked about with the pediatrician, where she can add value. So we want to invest where women make markets. Uh, we will invest in in uh, in six to ten companies a year within those areas where women make markets. And I prefer, uh, and I prefer that my funds invest in companies where you have a product or service that's already in the market. It could just barely be in the market, or it can be a prototype. But I want to see that that product or service with customers interacting with it because that really de-risks it. Uh, so I want to see that. Uh, and preferably, they're paying to interact with it. So a little bit of revenue. doesn't have to be a lot. Um, that's important to me. And the other is that I tend to like experienced teams. So, you know, what we often think about is an entrepreneur in the mythology, if we watch the Silicon Valley, you know, television show or something, is the 25-year-old or 20-year-old dropout out of Harvard or Stanford who's wearing a hoodie, who's never worked in a corporate environment, any kind of environment, and he's just, you know, comes right out of there brilliant, and we're going to put all this money behind him. Rarely do I back those companies that does exist in Silicon Valley. But I like to see companies where I have teams that have worked together. I prefer to see two to three founders. It's very difficult being on your own. Um, so I like to see at least two. I like to know that they've had experience in the space. I want to know they know the customer. So again, oftentimes you think of traditional, um, the Silicon Valley traditional, it's a young person Young guy who really knows how to, he's an engineer, he knows how to code, he may not know his customer. I flip that. I want to know that that person knows their customer and that from that they can build a product that customer will want. That's just our thesis. That's what we like. And we tend to invest in entrepreneurs that are a little older. Um, I would say probably our average age is probably early 40s. Um, we do have some 20 year old, 25 year olds. You know, we do have some, you know, a 60 year old and, um, you know, we like those, you know, we, we like expertise. So we like experience, like the product in the market, like big markets. We steer away from things that are kind of me too. And uh, we, we like to know what that gap is that we're filling. What about that niche market? Uh, we'll do, we'll do a niche if we think that you can protect it. So, you know, the issue with market size has to do with whether it's luck. There are a lot of mistakes that happen when you're building a company. And um, even if you're very experienced, you know, because the nature of entrepreneurship and innovation is that you're, you're going after, you're building products that, that either don't exist today or you're radically improving them. And so you will make mistakes. And so you have to have a market that's large enough that you can make a mistake and you can still build a good sized business. Now, the thing I would say about what people call niche markets, uh, Sylvia, one of my pet peeves is when you talk about a market where women is the buyer and they say, oh my gosh, I don't want to do a niche. I don't want to do something for women. You know, I, I, I have a company that deals with women and wealth. Women own $14 trillion of wealth. So a women in wealth, a company focused on women and wealth is not a niche market. It may be one of the largest markets we'll see in our lifetime. But but people get caught up in this idea um, that anything to do with women is is smaller or less important or a niche. Uh, I mean, even looking at, at breast pumps, that there's a that's a niche but it's it is a niche that has has not had new had not had new technology for 30 years and it was a fast growing space because so many so many women you know go back into the workplace 
you know, with a child that's under a year old. And so fast growth, little technology. We were using technology truly from 30 years ago. And so it really is, you know, if you want to be a smart investor, you need to be able to to really evaluate a market and evaluate the um, competitors and really see the amount of money that's being spent and what will be spent if you have something new that really is pretty radically, you know, innovated. Um, and that's that's what we like. The difference with this, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take a swipe at some of the male uh, VCs, uh, many of whom are my friends, but they will often, in I mean, dozens of them will invest in the same type of company. So that's what we call Me Too investing. That meets a really narrow need that, like a 25 year old guy, uh, you know, for instance, dating app Sylvia. You know, at one point, there were like 100 new dating apps that had been funded. Why? Because 25-year-old engineers have a problem finding girlfriends. Now, you know, that's really kind of a niche, but it was so overly funded because it was a niche they understood. It was a pain point they had, even though when, you know, it wasn't necessarily gigantic. And so we we have been hurt. Women have been, women have been uh, misused, I would say. Because the traditional VC does not understand large niches of products and services that we need in our lives. No, I love that. Um, and flipping, I, I love that flipping of that equation of saying, okay, um, I'm investing in, in, in older uh, founders. I'm going to be investing in markets that I care about. Flipping that equation, that's always my like million dollar question that I think I, I love this, is that the thought process before was like one in 10 survive. But if we flip that equation that you have just done and really make an impact into a market that's growing or a market that's never been invested in or a market that hasn't had any innovation for 30 years. Can we change that investment equation? Yes, I love that. So I love that so much. And that's why when we created our active aging fund, except for the AARP, that was the first venture fund ever that focused on, you know, a market for people over products and services for people over 50. Now, you know, this is a gigantic market. The baby boomer is market gigantic. They're not aging uh, like their parents, and they are very wealthy. And there are so many new creative ways and services and products and ways to make money. You know, but but think of it from so. But let's look at it just from an investor standpoint. So let's don't even say, you know, um, there's all these needs that they need. When you're investing in a marketplace or in a in, in a in a space where uh, there's a lot of demand, but there's not much venture money going in, then those deals are priced cheap. So you can invest in those companies at a lower value. You So when you invest, you get a larger percentage. And so when that company is sold later on or would go public, you own more of the company and you make more money. So not only are, are is this very impactful and you know and positive, but they're a better deal. For us as we invest as well as investors and so um so it's so wonderful in so many ways we get new products and services in the market we create marketplaces that don't exist and we add value you know in ways i mean i think about this even even if you you know that 75 percent of venture funds 75 percent of venture funds don't even have one woman partner so, and they're the most successful of them. So they're putting a lot of money to work. Even if they were going to invest in a company for an aging population, they may not even have the kind of expertise to, to make it most successful. So they, they're not the ones taking care of their elderly parents. Um, you know, they are, they're not the ones that are getting older. You know, it's mostly women. Um, they're not the ones that are starting those companies. One of the one of the most alarming statistics that I have read recently, uh, uh, studies, was it even a statistic, study, said that if it all, you know, we've tried so hard, you and I and others, to get more venture capital money into women-led companies. If a woman is funded, a woman CEO is funded by an all-male venture fund, she is now, we know, going to be, on average, less successful. 
um, in her co- let's uh, her company, and she will be less successful than if she's funded by a venture fund that has women partners or that is funded by a woman. You know, it's not necessarily very helpful to take these companies in industries where they're run mostly by women or women are the, the customers and get them into all male venture funds. We thought it was, but now the data is coming out. Um, and it just shows that whole understanding of the market and an understanding of how people operate. So uh, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of good um, new data coming out in the last three or four years that, you know, really is, informing both how we're practicing venture capital and I think should be informing how women are thinking when they're going out for venture capital. It's really important to have the right, the right money behind you and people that believe in you. And that, that good fit between the venture capitalist and that founder. So is it a a matter of mentoring or is it, um, what is that missing piece or do we not know that yet? We don't know that yet. Because the first thing I did was tear into that study. I wanted to figure it out. Was it that they weren't evaluating? You know, were the VCs, was it that the VCs weren't evaluating properly? Um, you know, were they getting into markets they didn't understand? Were there disconnects between communication because of maybe ways we communicate differently or we plan differently or we grow differently? They don't have that yet, but it is a Harvard study. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good, strong study. It had a good design, but we need to see a deeper analysis now to be able to get our hands around it. But those are the kinds of things we have to be, we, we really need to be thinking of. We're really kind of at, you know, I say we're at the, um, we're at a women's investing revolution. It's also a women's funding revolution. And um, we need to be leading that revolution because what we know is we can't take anything for granted. We can't take how it works with men investing in men and necessarily think that the best practice in that is going to work. Uh, we're finding out. We're finding out it's not working. But we just don't know how. But the interesting thing is, when women are invested in by teams where there is at least a woman in it, their uh, returns are better than men's returns. So it's not like it's a bad investment. Um, the, investing in women uh, CEOs is a very good venture investment. You just have to make sure it's the right the right combination. And that's that first round capital uh, research, correct? I love that first round capital research. They've done more investing in women than probably any other venture firm. And that's exactly right. They have found that their women led CEOs um, have much better returns. There's other data out there, but that's the largest model comparison model in a particular venture fund. That's wonderful. And then um when we're looking at success, you know, uh, the exit is what's successful. What does it take to have somebody go to an exit? Or what are your best practices towards a successful exit? Because we want to get them there. So if an angel investor can help another female founder, what how can she help her better? Yes. Um, you know, I would tell you too, that I think that's evolving in some really interesting ways. So that, you know, the traditional and uh, way to add value, and we do this, is to enable them to continue to find funding to, you know, help them add people to their teams, um, use your networks for that. Um, you know, we go that next step where we're actually helping them make markets because we are the, the buyers and the opinion leaders and the market makers in the spaces in which we invest. Um, you know, which is a little different than traditional, you know, angel or VC, which is very important. Um, and, and I think a, a subset of that, that we're too young yet really hasn't kicked in, but it's this concept of letting, letting your potential best customers buy into you as investors rather than buying them as customers. You know, it's very expensive. Marketing is a very big um, uh, part of a budget for an early stage company. And so if there's a way to enlist your most influential market makers, then you have to raise less money and you can hold on to a bigger percentage of your company. And so that's, you know, a really important way for us to look at this. Um, you know, when you're, you're always driving to capture as much of the market as possible for the exit. And you also need to be thinking earlier than what you might suspect about who those people are that might want to buy you and what it is they're going to be looking for to determine the value of the company um, 
when they would purchase it. So, um, you know, so even, you know, companies, very young companies, you know, might be on their, you know, second round of financing, you know, can already be talking, not in deep levels, but already be talking to people who are potential acquirers about what is the important indicators that would enable them to want to buy, to buy the company. You know, most of the companies are bought. They're not IPOs. So the majority of them are going to be purchased. And so that's something you want to kind of keep in the back of your mind. And as you grow, you know, you may be going for the, what, what a lot of people don't realize, a lot of angels don't when they first start, is you're only trying to raise enough money to get you to your next value, you know, your next high, high value proposition. So I may, my company today may be worth, $12 million. Um, it may take me $3 million, but in a year I'll be worth, you know, $30 million, you know? So you're really looking at, here's where I am today. Here's one, what I want, where, where I'm going to grow. This is what it's going to take. And when I hit those numbers, this is, uh, the value of the company because you don't want to sell, you don't want to give up your whole, you don't want to sell your whole company to get that money. So there's a lot of moving parts to it. And that's one you asked earlier about kind of that level of sophistication of knowledge, kind of the training. That's when you're getting, that's, that's the key. That's when you're getting up to that really very sophisticated level as an angel where it's kind of like chess. You're thinking, you know, four or five moves ahead and what is it going to take? And can that team then take that to that next level? And can they create enough value that I still, my little ownership, my 50,000 is still going to be worth something. That's that high level. Those are the, it, when you're a new angel, you want somebody else in that deal with you who's thinking like that. You know, in portfolio, that's that's that level of those leads. That's that Monty Nguyen or the Barbara Clark or the Beth Ann, Juliana or Lisa. Those are the people that, you know, oftentimes if, you know, when we have our LP, our members on, and they're listening to them evaluate, they can they can come up to speed in six months or so on evaluating a team. But it's that being able to think, really think ahead. And so it's just whatever level, whatever level you want to go to. Um, that's that's one of the kind of fun parts of that. But I want to circle around on that question if we have time. You know, it used to be always said, I think you mentioned it earlier that you'll do 10 deals and one deal will be, you know, the big hit. We, in venture, they use sports analysis. It's going to be the grand slam. And then maybe you're going to have, you know what, maybe you'll have a home run and then the rest will be, you know, doubles or singles and those are unimportant. And then, you know, all of the rest are going to be, you know, going to be just written off. So, you know, maybe you'll have one really big hit. That's very male-like. Uh, what I have seen with a lot of, very successful women VCs and angels and others is a movement away from that kind of thinking. In fact, one of my favorite analogies is we as women don't say, I'm going to have five kids and I'm going to figure out who's my smartest kid. And then the rest of them, you know, I'm not going to feed them as well. They're not going to go to school. You know, we look at all of our children and we say, you know, they all have these unique, um, you know, uh, skills and, and, you know, positive attributes. And I need to help this one in this way. And I have a mental model of what my children can become. And, you know, they may surprise me and be different, but, but you kind of have this view of who they are and what they need. And I really seen a, a different model where we're actually looking at that. Yes. Well, maybe one of them is, is, you know, not going to, keep up with the rest or whatever but it's like I have that same view of success for every company we invest in and and I'm going to keep that view uh, of what their success will be it may shift and change hopefully because they're as they grow but um, I never go in and I never think of my portfolio in any of my funds as there's so, you know I've got a bunch of dogs here and I have to figure out how to cut them off fast that to me is faulty thinking of and, uh, and, and a lot of these things are, you know, very hierarchical, um, you know, and very different. And I think what you're going to see today, when we think of venture capital and angel investing as a subset of, of venture, um, we think about one model. 
And then we think there's, a, there's like two or three different versions that are offshoots and not truly investing or not truly venture. And what I think we're moving toward is that 10 years from now, we are going to see 20 different successful models that are going to provide great returns. And they're very, very different from what we think of here as venture capital or venture investing at all. And very unique in how they got there. What does success look like as a, a, a founder and also as an angel investor th themselves? Yes, there's a lot of mythology here. And, and, you know, we're peeling away. That's why all these new studies, these studies of saying you need to do 30 deals or more, these studies of um, the importance of the link, you know, between this a common vision and a, and, a, and a way of communicating, connecting, you know, this is all new data. It's never been studied. Part of it is it wasn't transparent, so you can even capture the data. Now that's changing. You're going to see another thing. You're going to see a lot of software and a lot of AI and a lot of analytics never have been in angel investing. It's never been in venture investing. And we're seeing that, you know, with Portfolio itself, as you know, our goal with Portfolio is 115,000 women investing annually in Portfolio at an average of $15,000. Now, when we meet that, we will be the fastest growing venture capital firm in history. It'll be $1.8 billion invested uh, in 2020. I think it's 2021. You know, but still, a venture, venture capital, my friends in venture capital kind of poo-poo it and say, Trish, why, you know how to be a real VC. Why don't you be a real VC? Why do you want all of these women in? And, um, and it's, it's because it's so out of, today's model. But the impact will be way greater than, um, you know, than any new venture fund, fund in history. So we're just at that beginning. We're, we do things different, Sylvia. I've been all over the map on this you know, over, my, over my years on, you know, how differently women like to operate, how we like to collaborate. You know, really, I think what we're seeing and what the data data shows is we do think differently. We do collaborate differently. We do like to do different kinds of deals. We're doing this in different ways. And um, I'm just so thrilled to think about it. I have 27 year old daughters. And I believe today that my daughters are going to be part of an innovation ecosystem that we, we wouldn't even recognize today. It's gonna be so exciting. I'm excited for my 11 year old <laughs> uh, to get into that, that ecosystem uh, 10 years after, or 15 years after your daughters. That's going to be amazing. I, I, I love all of this. Uh, thank you so much, Trish, for, for being here today. I'm in completely enlightened even more about, about you personally and your uh, history, your uh, journey and anything else that you want to say about portfolio, just in case people want to be part of the fund, learn more about it. Yes, two things. We do. We always have funds open. We do let people come in for a minimum of $10,000 in a fund. And that money, as I said, is spread across six to 10 companies. So you're welcome. Um, you do need to be accredited, which means that right now this is a federal law uh, that you make $200,000 a year or $300,000 if you're with a partner um, and you're looking at your income together or that you have a million in assets minus your home come to Portfolio.com or contact me, Trish, at Portfolio.com. Would love to have you, and I can guarantee it. You guarantee you will enjoy the experience. Um, but I have one other thing I want to say, and that is that, um, Sylvia, you are such a bright, leading light in this work, and being able to uh, let people understand your, about how to invest, you know, supporting entrepreneurs, you yourself are such a successful um, and active investor, and you're doing such amazing work, not just in San Diego, but around the world. And so I just want to thank you for everything you do. And, and um, you are in a, an important um, person that I watch to see how the world is changing. So thank you for everything. Thank you, Trish, so much. I didn't expect that. So ah, thank you. <laughs> I have last four uh, questions that I've always asked everybody just to make sure that we have a rapid fire at the end. Um, what is your favorite angel investing resource? I know you've actually created a bunch of them. So which one is your favorite? Oh, my gosh, my favorite angel investing resource. Oh, that's a tough one. Or a couple of them. Okay, so I like, I like, I'll use this as a resource. 
I like the Angel Capital Association as a resource. I will say I'm also on their board. Um, but I think what they give is a global view of angel of angel investing, and that's a, a really important. And they provide the most baseline, uh, you know, early venture education as well as master's programs in it in angel education. Wonderful. What's your favorite book or books? So my favorite book in the space is uh, one by Brad Feld, and it's something like, uh, you know, entrepreneurs uh, know more than your uh, know more than your lawyers, and it's a nuts and bolts book about some of the things that can really hurt you as you fundraise. And it's focused for entrepreneurs, but it's really a book for angels and entrepreneurs and VCs. And he is one of the bright lights out in the country. He's the most transparent, open and uh, successful VCs and a good hearted guy. Thank you so much for that. And who has been your major influence in your life or in your professional uh, career? Jeffrey Timmons. Jeff Timmons was the, uh, the first uh, person to ever write a PhD on entrepreneurship. He was my mentor in creating the Kaufman Fellows. He was the dean of the Kaufman Fellows. Uh, he wrote New Venture Creation, was the first professor in entrepreneurship ever in in um uh in history and uh, a lovely man completely dedicated to Amer you know to america uh, meritocracy and a harvard professor so a brilliant man but just down to earth a really good guy and he's changed entrepreneurship for everyone and i um he's he's gone now but i think about him at least every week you know in that what would jeff do oh that's awesome what does abundance mindset mean to you, that abundant view of life? Oh, boy, I love that. You know, that's uh, uh, my, my, uh, my partner at uh, Portfolio, Amber Casca, and I were just talking about that today. It is, it's that, it's freedom. It's that freedom uh, and confidence to, you know, to find your path, to move on it, to act, uh, and to really live without fear. And, and it's something we all owe ourselves. We all owe ourselves the life where we, we can act without fear. Awesome. Thank you again, Trish, for being on the show, uh, the She Invest podcast. Um, I am honored and blessed always to listen to you and have conversations with you. My pleasure. Do more good work. Do more great work like you're doing. Bye, Trish. Thanks. See you later, Sylvia. I just had the most invigorating conversation with Trish Costello, who is a CEO of Portfolia and who has an amazing career as a venture capitalist, as an angel investor, as an entrepreneur herself, and has just made the most impactful career in actually writing checks, investing in startups that are not traditionally invested in by angel investors and VCs. She has also been an instrumental advocate and educator of angel investors and VCs through the Kaufman Fellows Program. So she is just an amazing wealth of information. One thing is creating an investment thesis for you as an angel investor, albeit if you're a new angel investor or an existing angel investor, really thinking about why you are investing. So three things that, that Trish went through was one is your knowledge, expertise, or passion is really, really important. Really understanding what you're bringing to the table as an angel investor, albeit if you have been in the professional world as a lawyer, or you are technical, you are a scientist, or expertise as a lawyer, maybe mergers and acquisitions, and also your passion as a mother, as an aunt, as a child of an elderly person. Number two is um, to look at the environment and see what's best in that environment for the expertise that you have. So really matching that passion and that expertise, who you are and matching that with what is available in your market and see what kind of startups that you can invest in, you can invest smartly in. And number three is money. How much money do you want to invest in startups? So based on the amount of money that you have collectively, what is a percentage that you are most comfortable with that you would feel like investing in startups, albeit if it's $10,000, 
$50,000 over the length of how many years? One, two, and three. Trish also talked about the differences between being a solitary angel investor and then also investing in a fund. A fund de-risks your investment by enabling you to count on the collective, count on other women or men in a fund that will lend their expertise, lend their passion, and lend their knowledge so that you can de-risk that initial investment or investments over the course of three years. Typically in a fund like Portfolio that she is CEO of, you can see up to five to 30 startups at a time that you can invest in. We talked a lot about what Portfolio is actually doing in disrupting the VC world. This was exciting information from Trish. And Portfolio is really at the forefront of creating a new experience for the female angel investor that is about creating new markets that mean something to families, to women and communities, creating new markets like femtech, figuring out what technologies, products and services that women need to be more successful or women need to be more healthier. We did a lot of examples uh, throughout the podcast about a new breast pump and stuff like that. Portfolio is also creating new markets for those women to invest in, like elder care and the elderly market. And the last thing we talked about, another aspect of this wonderful podcast is that we talked about the ick factor, is that traditionally VCs and angels are men, and they would never invest or maybe be reluctant to invest in startups that have the ickiness factor like menopause, like childbirth, like breastfeeding. So we are really creating as female angel investors, a new set of products and services that fit a market that we care about, that impact the global economy. So this was such an incredible podcast interview with somebody that has just made an indelible impact into the way that female angel investors invest, how they collectively invest, and how VCs are actually educated through Kauffman Foundation or other entities to be able to be better VCs, better angel investors. Trish Costello, she invests in women. She invests in startups that mean something to her. She invests in the future.